You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words in foreign lands, and all will understand. You shall see the face of God and the Let us pray. God of mercy, look with kindness on the soul of your servant Claire, who has now set down the burden of her 94 years. As she remained faithful throughout her long life, may you give her now the fullness of your peace and joy. We give thanks for the long life of Claire which we trust will now be caught up in your eternal love as we make our prayer in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord, now and forever. Amen. Let us be seated as we listen to the readings of the scriptures, the first to be proclaimed by John. Good morning. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. No torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead, and their passing away was thought an affliction. And their going forth from us utter destruction but they are in peace. For if to others indeed they seem punished, yet is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. 
as gold in the furnace, he proved them. And as a sacrificial offering, he took them to himself. In the time of their judgment, they shall shine and dart about as sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples. And the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth. And the faithful shall abide with him in love. Because grace and mercy are with his holy ones. And his care is with the elect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. salvation of whom should I be afraid of whom should I be afraid the Lord is my light and my salvation of whom should I be afraid of whom should I be The Lord is my light and my help, whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, before whom should I shrink? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom should I be afraid? Of whom should I be afraid? There is one thing I ask of the Lord, for this I long, to live in the house of the Lord all the day of my love. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom should I be afraid? Of whom should I be afraid? I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Hope in him and take heart. Hope in the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom should I be afraid? Of whom should I be afraid? He invites Grace forward now to proclaim for us the New Testament reading.
Good morning. morning. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Your kindness should be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, then the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We invite you to please stand. with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of Moses. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple And when Mary and Joseph brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you can dismiss your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of your people Israel. And the child's mother and father were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed 
and a sword shall pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. She seldom left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated for a few moments. When I heard that Claire had passed away last Sunday evening, I must admit, I was a bit shocked. Now, those who didn't know Claire might think it foolish that anyone be surprised that someone even in their 10th decade, never mind one who was on oxygen, contending with heart failure, would pass away. But as you all know, if you knew Claire, and even saw her not so long ago, you might be taken aback, as was Terry Monroe, who had given her communion just last week. Claire, even though tethered to an oxygen line and thinner than usual, was still Claire. There was an elan vital, an indefatigable spirit, so thoroughly characteristic of her that remained strong right till the end. But while we may have been getting ready to lose her, we were still not quite expecting to do so just yet. However, we learn once again, we are not the ones to write the script. So the inevitable has come. And today, we find ourselves here in sadness, in this place so familiar to Claire, to say our farewells to a loving and grateful mother and grandmother, an aunt, a neighbor, a most faithful Catholic and loyal parishioner, and a wonderful friend. And as we must take leave of Claire, there is only one true consolation, and that is the one offered to us by faith, which they say is more likely caught than taught. Thus, if that is true, then we would have to diagnose Claire Twitchell as so filled with it as to be highly contagious. And if we have been infected by her zeal for her Catholicism, we should count ourselves greatly blessed. For if from the perspective of faith, we would listen to these readings from Scripture this morning, even though they come to us from the distant past, we can readily see a relevance to Claire's life and thus receive the comfort that the Scripture's message is intended to impart to us now in the face of her death. The souls of the righteous are in the hands of God, and no torment shall touch them. But who are the righteous, we must ask, because the biblical definition of righteousness is a bit different than the common understanding. In truth, in the biblical understanding, the righteous are those who strive always to live in right relationship with God, doing so by recognizing the many gifts he gives, beginning with that of life itself, thus never failing to gratefully offer to God the worship he is due. They are those who acknowledge God's sovereignty. Thus, they desire to live by his commandments. And as they do, they end up living in right relationship with all other people as well. This is Claire Twitchell. Claire, as a daughter, a sister, 
especially a mother and grandmother, fiercely loyal to her family, unconditionally loving, but rawly honest and realistic, and thus sometimes admittedly a bit challenging, only because Claire wanted those she recognized as her own to be and to have the best. That would be a fitting description of Claire as a teacher too, and as a friend, and even as a parishioner, ever loyal and supportive, but never shy to share her opinion or suggestion, usually carefully considered, if she thought it was for the priest or the parish's greater good. Claire was obviously righteous in her crusade for the protection of the most vulnerable of human lives, keenly aware that justice requires that a voice be given to the voiceless, no matter the costs in opposition or ridicule. And so for three decades, Claire persevered in lending her voice as an advocate for the lives of those not yet born. And she did this right to the very end. Indeed, across the nine decades she has lived, Claire was certainly at times tried by grief, disappointment, opposition, but through the bad and the good, she kept faith and lived love. And so we should conclude that she was indeed proved true and so is destined now as promised by God to be blessed by him. The gospel places before us Simeon and Anna, who were among those at the time of the first coming of Christ, those who had not given up hope of seeing the day of the Messiah's arrival. They were those who kept faith and trusted that the promises of God, though delayed, would be fulfilled. St. Luke calls them prophets. But again, the biblical concept of prophet is not quite the same as the more common understanding of prophet as someone who can see or predict the future. Rather, biblically speaking, a prophet is someone who by their unshakable faith, their clear understanding of the word, workings, and will of God, born of their sincere prayer and worship, is placed in the midst of others of their day who tend to fall away to speak for the Lord himself in calling them back. So we should imagine that Simeon and Anna frequently in the temple, as we are told, were trying to remind others to prepare themselves for, for what they sensed would soon happen and trusted that they would live to see, which was the coming of Jesus as Messiah. We should also imagine that their message wasn't always that well received, that they were considered by some to be nuisances especially those disturbed by their beliefs and their claims, because if these were true, it might require those who heard them to have a change of mind and heart. Indeed, one thing in common among all those named as prophets throughout the scriptures is that their message was ignored by many and outrightly rejected by others. All prophets faced opposition, but they remained faithful as they delivered the message they were to proclaim. Even if opposed, they reiterated it anyway. God's ways then are God's ways now. And so Anna and Simeon provide us an example how God is working among us even in our time. So as we come here today, to say and pray our farewells to Claire. She herself was prophetic as a woman of unshakable faith, deep hope, and tremendous love. The parallels are clear in that Claire has also lived a long life like Anna. And in Claire's retirement and her widowhood, she worshiped here frequently and in everything as our second reading urges us, she gratefully and prayerfully made her needs and requests known to God. 
Indeed, Claire is unquestionably part of the faithful remnant in our own day, who even in the face of widespread unbelief, still trust that the promises of the Lord to return again are due to be fulfilled. Obviously, Claire took extra care to prepare herself to meet the Lord, even as he comes among us now, here in word and sacrament. And thus, also for the day, she knew she would see him face to face. And she never tired of urging others to take care to do the same. All who are baptized are anointed and commissioned to participate in their own particular way in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly ministry of Jesus Christ. This can be accomplished by trying to bring God to people and people to God, by proclaiming God's word through their own words and actions, especially as what they say and do is in accord with the commandments. Some do fulfill this baptismal commission. Sadly, some do not. Clearly, Claire did. She was gifted to accept and fulfill all the various roles she would play in life. But among them all, she was graced to understand her ultimate purpose in life. Thus as evidenced by the spiritual gifts that animated Claire, she can be seen to have actually relied on that gift of the Holy Spirit given to her in confirmation, tapping into those gifts by prayer. And so God's Spirit was the inspiration of the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom she possessed, the piety she practiced, the right judgment she exercised, and the fortitude so evident in Claire as she forged on, even in the face of opposition, proclaiming a gospel of life. At every opportunity, Claire would remind anyone she could who she felt did not fully or rightly believe or who had fallen away that Christ is found among us right here and now in the Eucharist, and he will be met one day personally by all of us hereafter. And it is those who follow him here who are destined to be greatly blessed. Although her life will not be recorded in the scriptures or even history books, Claire was like Anna and Simeon, one who allowed herself to be used by God to speak his message to us in our time and place, boldly inviting all who don't yet believe or who have lost faith to find it in Jesus Christ. In our contemporary culture, Many will say that all paths lead to where Claire is now destined to be. But that is only human conjecture. It isn't divine revelation. Claire's deep conviction was based in revelation, and it is that the vehicle by which we are meant by God to be carried home to his kingdom, though at times in its history badly damaged or even broken down, is the church. This is the community of faith Christ established with his apostles for that sole purpose, one which he has passed down through them and their successors to us, a community in which his word is to be heard and the sacraments so essential to our sanctification are celebrated. While all culture in its per per political correctness drifts ever further toward this new age homogenization of all religions being of equal value, totally optional in accord with one's personal preference. Claire cared nothing whatsoever about being culturally relevant or politically correct. Thus, Claire lived and died as a fiercely loyal member of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, and with prophetic courage and persistence, she never hesitated to urge others to be the same. For this, we should not only long remember her, better yet, we should imitate her. 
The prayer on the lips of Simeon in this passage from St. Luke is known as the Nunc Dimittis, and by ancient tradition, it is the last prayer of each day in the Liturgy of the Hours, which is celebrated by monastics and clerics and even committed lay people throughout the church. And so appropriately, it is the last prayer of life's day for those who, like Claire, place all their faith and trust in God and rely for their salvation on the grace he provides for the church established by his son. So appropriately, we pray this prayer in a personalized way for Claire as we commend her strong soul to God at the end of this life's day and what in faith we trust will be for her the dawning of a new and endless day, the day she longed to see in God's presence. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace according to your promise. Claire will see with her own eyes the salvation you have prepared in the sight of all peoples, a light revealed even to unbelievers, and the endless glory for all like her who by their deep faith reveal they belong to you and your holy people. Amen. Let us stand and turn to God with confidence to offer our prayers that he who raised his son Jesus Christ from death will raise Claire and all the faithful to life eternal in his presence. And we respond, Lord, hear our prayer. For Claire, who became a part of Christ through baptism and whose life of faith, hope, and love bore much good fruit, that she may now enjoy the fullness of life in God's presence, we pray to the Lord. For John Twitchell, Rebecca Horton, Douglas Horton, Jim Gallagher, and all who have gone before Claire in faith, that she will be joyfully reunited with them forever in the Father's house, we pray to the Lord. For all who accompanied Claire on the last mile of this life's journey, especially her loving family and friends, may they be ever inspired by her unfailing faith, even in the face of her final illness and death, and be comforted by her peaceful passing. For this we pray to the Lord. For all who devote themselves to care for those who are ill, aged, or infirm, for doctors, nurses, therapists, health aides, pastoral visitors, and all caretakers. May they persevere in their important work, aware that they are instruments of the Lord's healing love. For this we pray to the Lord. For the laity who, like Claire, are ever faithful and deeply devoted to the church, that in cooperation with clergy and religious, they will, through prayer and action, strive to build up and strengthen the body of Christ in this time and place. For this we pray to the Lord. For all of us present here, that remembering Claire's deep dedication to the cause of human life, we will be re-inspired to do our part to advocate for the protection of the lives of those not yet born. We pray to the Lord. For Claire's family especially, and for her many friends and associates, that their gratitude at the many gifts they have been blessed to experience through Claire will help overshadow some of the sadness they now feel at her death. For this we pray to the Lord. For all those personal petitions which in confidence we pause to mention in silence.
for all our needs, we pray to the Lord. Lord, may you support us all the day long till shadows lengthen and evening falls and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, Lord, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at last. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Please be seated now as we prepare the altar to celebrate the Eucharist. And once prepared, we invite Donna and Carol Twitchell to bring forward the gifts of bread and wine. shelter of the Lord who abide in his shadow for life say to the Lord my refuge my rock in whom I trust and he will raise you up on eagles wings the sun and hold you in the palms of his hand. The snare of the fowler will never capture you, and famine will his wings your refuge his faithfulness your shield and he will raise you up on eagle's wings bear you on the breath of dawn make you to shine like the sun Together pray that my sacrifice and yours will be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands and the praise of his name for our good and good and holy church. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, we ask your mercy 
that she who never doubted your son to be a loving savior may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son. In him, the hope of resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful people, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, We sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy. prayer. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink
therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Edgar, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember the soul of your servant Claire, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she, who through baptism was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection, when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To all our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages and praise you without end through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on this world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. As the people of Advent faith long for the coming of that promised kingdom where we hope to be reunited with Claire and all the faithful again, let us pray as Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who on the day of your glorious resurrection appeared before your disciples, saying, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity 
in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us turn and offer to one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. For the reception of communion, if you'd kindly come by the main aisle and return by the sides, if it isn't your custom to receive communion, but you would like to come forward in the procession to receive a blessing. If you approach with your hands folded rather than outstretched, we will be happy to impart that blessing to you. Celebrate for you are with us. 
Let us pray. O God of our ancestors in faith, by the covenant made on Mount Sinai, you have taught your people to strengthen the bonds of family through faith, honor, and love. And so we pray, look with kindness on the soul of your servant Claire, a mother and grandmother who desired to bind her family to you. Bring her now to our heavenly home, where all your saints live in blessedness and peace. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. We invite you to be seated now as Claire's daughter, Tara, comes forward to share some personal reflections with us about her mom.
A couple of months ago, when my mother and I were discussing possible hymns for her funeral, I suggested one of my own favorites, Gentle Woman. She hesitated for only a moment. Nah, that's not gonna work, she said. They'd have to sing Not So Gentle Woman for me. <laughs> she was not a gentle woman. She was a force of nature. She was fierce, opinionated, and incredibly strong. In her late 80s, she helped my sister pack up and move to a new home, and that included moving furniture. A yoga devotee, she could still bend at the waist and pick up a crumb from the floor four days before she died. Her slant board was long a part of her dining room decor. All that blood rushing to her head every day made her look younger. She moved at one speed, fast. Not so much walking as rushing forward. She didn't always know where she was going, but her purposeful stride was so convincing that she once led a group of hapless pil pilgrims to the Holy Land down a back alley to nowhere. She even drove fast, not that she arrived, ever arrived anywhere on time. And she was tireless. After all, she raised four children, worked full time, and took evening graduate classes in an era when most women just stayed at home. When she retired to Cape Cod, she continued to teach nursery school, substitute at various grammar schools. She also got a real estate license and became a real estate agent. And she took care of my grandparents in their last years, as well as my father when he was stricken with Alzheimer's. And when any of her many, many friends needed some help, she was there for them. That trip to the Holy Land, she did that between rounds of chemotherapy for stage four cancer. Years later, when I complained that I had to go have some tests done because there was cancer in the family, she said, in all seriousness, really? Who had cancer in our family? I said, Mom, you did. Oh, that? That was just a fluke. <laughs> when congestive heart failure slowed her down a couple of months ago. Whoops. What to do with the rest of it? Sorry. <laughs> slowed her down this past year. The only thing she complained about was her loss of energy. Where's my pep, she'd say. I need to get my pep back. But while her pep left her, her sense of humor remained to the end. How are you doing, Mrs. Twitchell? The EMT asked after he had administered some pain meds for her last trip to the ER. Well, she said dryly, I'm breathing. <laughs> I wish I could recite more of her one-liners, but one memorable incident from my childhood illustrates not only her humor and her charm, but her utter unflappability. She was driving us somewhere, three of us in the back seat fooling around, and little Jason in the front in what passed for a car seat in those days when she flew through a stop sign and got pulled over. As the policeman approached the car, she rolled down her window. Officer, I'm guilty, she called out. Please arrest me. Put 
me in jail. Lock me up in a nice quiet cell away from these bickering children. I don't think he expected that. But keeping a straight face, the officer stuck his head in the car, gave us a stern lecture about distracting our mother when she was driving, and let mom go without so much as a warning. Properly chastened, we sat there in stunned silence until she said with a smirk, your father does not need to know about this. <laughs> Poor dad, there was a lot he didn't need to know about. My mother was a beautiful woman. Perhaps that too accounted for the cop's leniency. We didn't know she was beautiful back then, of course. She was just our mother. But I can recall a man asking her once in the early 1960s if she was Jackie Kennedy. She was wearing a simple but elegant sheath dress that day in blocks of black and tan. With her short dark hair and her wonderful cheekbones, she did indeed resemble Jackie. Her enormous blue eyes and wide infection smile, however, were all her own. She ran a tight ship. At the same time, she filled our house with love, laughter, books, and homemade baked goods. Save room for dessert, she always said. She was still baking almost to the end. Her hermits are remembered with fondness by the thrift shop volunteers and the Ketuit library staff. When my brother John was about five or so, he announced that he was joining the army. Just have one question, he said. Do they let you bring your mother with you? <laughs> she was that kind of mother. Mom ran her classroom like her home. She was stern, but nurturing. She introduced her students to the humor and wordplay of Shel Silverstein and to the trials of the pioneer life of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Jason remembers a boy saying to him in elementary school, your mother is Mrs. Twitchell? In a tone of both awe and pity. Other than refusing to admit she was wrong and occasionally being a little too free with her advice, mom's one shortcoming was that she was overly frugal. She could be generous too, of course, but her default mode was penny pincher. The thermostat was always set at 66 degrees. The tin foil was wrinkled with multiple uses and a tea bag was considered good until it had been used to make three or four cups of tea. I personally will never get over her bringing Ocean State job lot granola bars on a trip to Italy to save money on the food in Italy. <laughs> I know some of you remember her for her bright clothing and uh, always wore her makeup, but uh, she didn't start out that way. During her early teaching career, she, brought, she bought two prim shirtwaist dresses a year at a bargain basement store and then knit her own sweaters. Beautifully, I might add. It was almost painful for her that, to have to spend money on herself. When I asked once if this was because she was brought up during the Depression, her sister replied, no, we were very comfortable during the Depression. She's just cheap. <laughs> My mother's defining strength was her great faith. She loved being a Catholic, and she wanted to share the joy of believing with everyone she met. She even attempted a last-minute conversion on her hospice volunteer. 
She was devoted to the Blessed Mother and prayed the rosary daily. It's so typical of mom that her favorite rosary beads were not the ones from Rome or Lourdes or Fatima, but a simple pair made of blue string that a street vendor in Boston gave her. When my sister's 11-year-old daughter was killed by a drunk driver, my mother's faith never wavered. Her heart was broken, but she powered us forward through our grief with dignity. My mother was always firmly pro-life, but after Rebecca's death, she became even more actively involved in this cause. She was an integral part of Mass Citizens for Life for 30 years and worked in this parish for 30 years as well. She felt that in, in addition to raising her family, this work was her greatest accomplishment. Mom was only fully conscious, conscious once during her last day here. She opened her eyes, looked at us, and said, I went to heaven. We know that, Mom. We know. We come now to that portion of the church's funeral liturgy that is known as the commendation and the farewell. The saying goodbye and the handing over. Certainly, so many of us gathered here know with great certainty how much a part Claire was of this assembly of the faithful here on earth that we call Christ the King Parish. And so now it is our certain hope that she will be among the faithful all assembled before God in the new and the eternal Jerusalem after having visited the earthly one. So with that confidence, we make our final prayers. We sing a song of farewell, and as a gesture of offering and respect, we in incense Claire's body with the same respect that we incense the gifts that became for us the Eucharist today. we must now commend the soul of our sister Claire in the sure and certain hope 
that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with Christ, body and soul, on the last day. We thank you for the many blessings that you gave Claire throughout her 94 years of life and the blessings that her life has brought to so many others. Let these be signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to the soul of your servant Claire and help all who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our sister Claire forever. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Claire, may the angels lead you into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. And where Lazarus is poor no longer, may you find eternal rest. In the sure hope of the resurrection, let us go now in the peace of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou 